Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to News Rumah. I'm your host, Rumah Khalil. But today is Friday, the 20th of September, 2024. Another month is uh, getting to its end, but lots to discuss with you during the course of this one hour. We'll begin with the, the U.S.-Pakistan relations in the whole context of the acceptance of uh, the letter of credence from Pakistan's new envoy, Rizwan Saeed Sheikh. This happened in the U.S. And of course, while accepting the letter of credence from uh, the new ambassador of Pakistan, to the U.S., Joe Biden had a lot to say as far as the gamut of Pakistan-U.S. relations is concerned. We'll be discussing these different aspects and what needs to be done to further strengthen uh, these very avenues. In our second segment, we'll be talking about uh, the day 349 of uh, the Israel-Palestine war, whether on the one hand uh, the brutalities in Gaza continue, on the other hand Middle East is slowly and steadily embro getting embroiled in uh, more and more tensions. Uh, on the one hand, we've got these, uh, you know, the, uh, the pager uh, explosions that happened during the course of Tuesday and Wednesday. And then there are the continued attacks also from uh, the Israeli side into Lebanon. There have been severe reactions that have come uh, from uh, the Lebanese government as well as from Hezbollah's chief. Uh, this said, we will also be highlighting different other aspects of this very conflict that is slowly and steadily becoming more aggressive and violent. This is going to be our second segment. Then we are going to talk about Pakistan that has been elected as a member of the uh, IAEA's Board of Governors. Uh, this is Pakistan's 21st term on the Board of Governors of the IAEA. IAEA. And of course, we all know Pakistan's importance as far as nuclear energy is concerned and the peaceful use of nuclear energy, especially. Finally, we'll be talking about Turkish doctors, ladies and gentlemen, that have successfully separated 11th month old Pakistani conjoined twins in a marathon, 14 hour surgery. And of course, the twins are doing very well and they are slowly and steadily recovering from all of this. And the parents of the twins were extremely grateful for all uh, the uh, effort that was made by the Turkish doctors. This is going to be our last story. Let's begin with our first and that concerns US-Pakistan relations, the whole gamut of the relations. And of course, in the context, in the latest context of uh, the, the letter of credence that was accepted uh, by Joe Biden of our new ambassador there, Rizwan Saeed Sheikh. We've been joined by uh, Ehsan Hamid Durani, he's a director of Policy Research Center. Ehsan, thank you very much to have joined us. Ehsan, uh, Joe Biden uh, emphasizes on an enduring partnership between Pakistan and the U.S. that he says is crucial for global and regional stability. Uh, how can this enduring partnership between these two countries ensure global and, uh, of course, regional stability in your point of view? Because I feel it's a very important point and I'd like your point of view on it. Uh, thank you, Umar. Uh, I think uh, it's, a, it's a very important statement coming from uh, Joe Biden right before he's going into, um, uh, 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 U.S. is going into an election cycle. Uh, uh, ultimately, I mean, U.S.-Pakistan relations um, have a history. Um, it may be a rocky history. There have been highs and lows uh, in this uh, relationship. But overall, it's a, it's a very robust relationship. And the two countries share a lot of uh, uh, deep-rooted strategic um, 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 interest with each other. And it, it, it goes as far as uh, to 1950s, where Pakistan joined the, uh, the, the, the bloc uh, established by the Western world, led by the U U.S. And uh, I think the partnership uh, to which uh, uh, Mr. Biden has currently referred to is uh, uh, the, the, the threat of transnational terrorism that can emanate from Afghanistan, um, which for which Pakistan's enduring partnership is very important uh, for not just for regional stability, but for also um, this, the U.S. The security of U.S. homeland as well, uh, because period in the past, Afghanistan has been a center stage of um, you know, atta launching attacks on U.S. homeland. We we have the example of 9/11. You know, talking of counterterrorism you know, at our hands. Okay, as in you're talking of counterterrorism, you're of course talking of, uh, with reference to Afghanistan. I'd like to refer to another statement that was made by the state office spokesperson Matthew Miller way back in July. Uh, he uh, was when he, he was asked to comment on then. Uh, this then statement by Khaja Asif Saab, who's our defense minister, uh, that Pakistan will continue launching attacks against terrorist groups as part of a new military campaign. He had acknowledged Pakistan's unmatched sacrifices and contributions in the war against terrorism 
and uh, said that uh, Pakistan had greatly suffered at the hands of terrorists. He said, and I quote, Pakistani people have suffered greatly in the hands of terrorists. We have a shared interest in combating threats to regional security. When you look at the counter-terrorism efforts uh, by Pakistan, they are, uh, of course, commendable. How uh, important is a U.S.-Pakistan joint, robust uh, counter-terrorism uh, collaboration in order to further thwart this enemy design that is coming from across the border? Uh, I think it, it's very important and uh, um, um, it has a history of, uh, you know, um, counter-terrorism. The two countries share a, a long uh, history of counter-terrorism, joint counter-terrorism cooperation. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, that uh, U.S. still uh, even... Uh, General Mike Corella, the commander of the C Central Command, U.S. CENTCOM, uh, in his testimony to U.S. Um, state, uh, U.S. Uh, Congress, uh, said that uh, um, ISKP, uh, which is the Islamic State of Khorasan Province, has uh, uh, all the capabilities of launching an attack on U.S. homeland and plunging the region into another um, uh, 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 mire of, uh, 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 you know, uh, instability. So uh, uh, Pakistan's cooperation with U.S. Uh, is very important in, in counterterrorism. Pakistan, all, U.S. has provided a lot of support um, that is technical and uh, material support. Um, recently, the U.S. Uh, um, um, Bureau of INL um, um, has provided uh, um, support uh, to the counterterrorism uh, department of uh, KP police. Uh, they have also provided uh, support on uh, improving border security, uh, border management, um, and uh, these this uh, did, and there, then there is support on counterintelligence uh, as well. So I mean the the, the partnership is really robust. The partnership is. Uh, are really strong. The military to military ties are very strong, of course, um, in terms of countering all these uh, different threats. And uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it can, uh, it has a lot of room of improvement as well. And uh, with, with the threats that are emanating in the region and the situation that is that we're seeing in Afghanistan, this, uh, this, uh, this partnership has a lot of room to improve as well. I agree with you on that, S. And also, you know, I'd like to now come towards specific points that Joe Biden highlighted during his uh, short uh, meeting and statement uh, on the time of the acceptance of the letter of credence of our ambassador to the U.S. He has, uh, our, the U.S. president has reaffirmed the U.S. commitment to working with Pakistan to address challenges such as climate change, security threats, and health issues. Cl uh, security threats we've already discussed to some extent. What developments have we seen on the front of climate change and health issue collaboration in your point of view? And how I do you feel both these countries could further bolster their cooperation or collaboration in these avenues? Not the security part, but the health issues as well as uh, climate change. Uh, yeah, I think uh, recently we have seen some positive developments that uh, US has uh, shown support and Pakistan has uh, shown acceptance towards uh, diversifying the relations towards non-security uh, or non-traditional security uh, areas such as health, um, climate change. Uh, let me tell you that uh, since uh, 2022, Pakistan has held six uh, mid-level dialogues with the U.S. Uh, we had a uh, climate uh, change dialogue, we've had a uh, health dialogue, we, along with, of course, the counterterrorism dialogue as well. So we have, in total, we had six uh, dialogues uh, with, with the U.S. And uh, um, in, in terms of climate change, U.S. has uh, invested a lot of uh, um, uh, resources uh, in uh, developing the capacity of uh, Pakistani um, organizations, the government as well, in tackling the, the, the issue of the climate change. We know the U.S.-Pakistan uh, Green Alliance framework, which is to advance the cooperation in climate smart agriculture, renewable energy and uh, water management, uh, which is the main vehicle of uh, cooperation between uh, the two countries. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Development Finance Corporation, uh, the DFC, has also uh, explored opportunities in further um, uh, doing investments in the in the climate uh, um, uh, economy of Pakistan. Uh, with regards to health, I think uh, uh, a lot has been done, but still it's a, it's a, it's a it's a uh, area that needs to be explored. Pakistan's health sector is 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 a huge market for for U.S. Um, investments. Um, uh, we we have seen that uh, we we've had a health dialogue, U.S. Pakistan health dialogue. 
uh, if it's, which was uh, executed at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, we have also seen that U.S. has given uh, technological support and uh, importing best practices in developing the Center for Disease Control in Pakistan uh, just after the, 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 the pandemic back in 2022. Um, some, uh, we've also seen support in tackling COVID-19 pandemic from, from U.S. So I think the partnership can be real. You know, it has a lot of potential to further grow. Uh, the DFC, which is a $100 billion U.S. dollar fund uh, of uh, U.S. State Department, can explore more opportunities in the, in the health sector of Pakistan um, by uh, uh, investing in the basic health units or the rural uh, health uh, infrastructure of Pakistan, which uh, really needs injection of uh, resources and expertise. I agree again. Uh, now, you know, I, I, I now refer to some of the statements that were made by our ambassador while he was meeting with Joe Biden. He talks about Pakistan-U.S. economic partnership and relationship, which he says is central to our engagement. And the United States, he says, remains the largest destination for Pakistani exports. Also, uh, he has expressed Pakistan's readiness to expand its economic ties with the U.S. by welcoming investments in alternative energy, in green technology, in the industry, digital platforms, platforms and higher education. How, in your point of view, can Pakistan benefit from U.S. investments in these very categories, these five categories? What measures need to be taken in your point of view? Uh, I'll come again to my point of, you know, U.S. Uh, International Development Finance Corporation, the U.S. DFC. Um, uh, it can explore opportunities uh, in, in Pakistan in, in the health sector. Uh, in uh, by collaborating in uh, renewable energy, uh, information technology, textiles and pharmaceuticals, um, by facilitating partnerships and offering support and prom promoting uh, uh, sustainable uh, practices in these sectors. And uh, uh, Pakistan's startup culture is, uh, or entrepreneurship ecosystem is a growing market. Pakistan has a huge uh, youth population, which, uh, which has a huge potential as well, which is very talented. Uh, it just needs the right skills, the right platforms. Uh, it needs uh, access to U.S. markets. Uh, U.S. is still uh, the largest uh, market for Pakistani exports. Uh, almost 10 billion of our uh, exports are to U.S. market. But I think on the technological front, we need more access to U.S. Uh, techno technology companies. Uh, the uh, uh, Pakistani uh, startup uh, um, organizations um, uh, can access and make Pakistan an export hub for software um, export to U.S. Uh, uh, market and because U.S. has a huge demand for for software um, uh, because of its uh, you know technological uh, greatness. So Pakistan can provide those uh, those services uh, in, in terms of uh, meeting those technological demands. Uh, in return, I think U.S. what U.S. can do is U.S. can invest in building, uh, supporting startups. We have the National Incubation Centers, which is sort of, uh, you know, uh, develop the, the ecosystem or promote the eco startup ecosystem in Pakistan. U.S. can invest in that. We have seen that some initiatives have been supported by the U.S. Embassy in the past, but I think more needs to be done on that front as well. Uh, especially for women entrepreneurs, I think uh, a lot of opportunities can be created uh, and uh, a lot of... Uh, as well uh, I think the, the not just from an investment point of view I think uh, uh, the number of scholarships for Pakistani students needs to be increased by the State Department so more best practices can be imported back home also you know any any uh, aspect of a bilateral relationship between two countries depends on its people the people to people cooperation is something that all countries, including Pakistan, emphasize on how do you view the people-to-people -people relationship between Pakistan and the U.S.? We've got a huge uh, Pakistani diaspora in the U.S., which also is composed of doctors and engineers and software engineers that are working there and are uh, making a mark not only for Pakistan, but also they are building on the trust between the two countries. How do you view this people-to-people -people relationship and how can that be made more robust? Pakistan um, almost has uh, half a million Pakistanis uh, are living in U.S. Mm -hmm. and uh, they are working in good positions. Um, we have a, a big diaspora of Pakistani doctors. Those doctors are well respected in U.S. They are very well established. We have Pakistani businesses, uh, businessmen in, in, in U.S. Uh, and these, uh, th this diaspora um, 
holds a significant uh, influence uh, in U.S. Uh, in terms of uh, influencing policies as well, uh, because they are well established um, economically, financially in U.S., and uh, they can be a can can be a cornerstone in uh, developing uh, U.S.-Pakistan uh, bilateral relations. Um, they they can lobby their uh, uh, their respective legislators in 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 fostering a more collaborative arrangement, more co collaborative cooperation between Pakistan and U.S. Uh, they they can also play a, a, a huge role in. Uh, bringing investments uh, to Pakistan uh, by, uh, you know, attracting or by convincing or uh, creating an environment for U.S. companies to come to Pakistan and invest in in a lot of different areas, such as the renewable energy, green energy, uh, technology, IT infrastructure, telecommunication. All these sectors can, uh, are, are, uh, you know, can provide a very uh, fertile ground for for U.S. investments. So I think the diaspora has a very important. Role. Other than that, I mean, diaspora uh, we, we, has also a very important political role uh, in, in U.S. And on a political front, they can play a very important role in cultivating um, uh, strong bilateral relations between the two countries. All right. Our ambassador during this whole conversation also talks about enhancing structural dialogue in, uh, you know, areas that are security as well as non-security. What are the different mechanisms that are available for this structured dialogue currently between the two countries and what needs to be done in that respect? Yeah, almost uh, uh, six dialogues in total have been conducted so far, um, uh, including health dialogue, climate change dialogue, um, um, counterterrorism dialogue. Um, uh, and, and three other dialogues as well. Uh, in the past, we have uh, we have seen that Pakistan and U.S. attempted to um, uh, to start a comprehensive strategic dialogue uh, back in 2000, uh, uh, 2010 as well, then in 2015 as well. But uh, those attempts have failed. Uh, now, I think with uh, as Pakistan and U.S. Uh, bilateral relations have. The scope of the relations have, uh, you know, broadened. Now we have the non-traditional uh, um, uh, matters as well. Uh, for example, health and climate change. So now I think the scope has broadened. So it's time again for for the two countries to ponder upon in engaging uh, in a broader uh, strategic uh, dialogue uh, and uh, developing a framework. Because Pakistan and U.S. relations uh, have uh, have a have a history of you know turbulence, and uh, unless Pakistan has a, the two countries have a strategic dialogue uh, and lay out a comprehensive framework. I think uh, the, the, the relations uh, cannot go forward. And uh, with the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, uh, it's, 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 more, it's, uh, it's um, relevance uh, towards, uh, I, I would say, um, India. Uh, it's, it's even more important for the two countries uh, to have this strategic dialogue, to carve out a place for Pakistan in, 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 in U.S. Uh, foreign policy. All right. Now, I'll, I'll go back a couple of months and go to the month of March this year when Joe Biden wrote a letter to our Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif uh, talking about the enduring partnership between uh, the U.S. and Pakistan. That was critical to ensure the security of our people and people across the world, quote, Unquote. He talks about continuing to stand with Pakistan to tackle the most pressing global and regional challenges of our time. How have both countries developed uh, you know, worked on that front since the month of March? We are now end of September. Uh, I think uh, uh, what we have seen is that some high level visits uh, have happened um, uh, recently. The Under Secretary for Political Affairs of the uh, U.S. State Department visited. Uh, Pakistan, um, um, our Prime Minister uh, will be visiting uh, U.S. as well for the UN General Assembly um, uh, soon. Uh, so I think uh, um, uh, between that period, uh, I, I won't say uh, anything significant has happened, uh, but uh, I think uh, with these high-level exchanges and these pleasantries, <clears throat> and now since we have a new U.S. ambassador uh, in Washington as well, uh, I'm really hopeful that uh, the two countries uh, will um, uh, um, bolster, bolster their uh, its um, uh, cooperation, and um, as I mentioned, that uh, 
there's a room for uh, you know uh, there's a ve- huge potential for a, a comprehensive strategic dialogue that the two countries can engage in and uh, uh, i see that uh, in the coming years especially after election year oh, uh, 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 you know wh- whoever comes into power if it's harris or trump um, they have to give a foreign policy plan and uh, uh, with the pakistan's uh, strategic importance growing in the region um they have to accommodate um, uh, a, a big role for pakistan in us foreign policy all right that will only see will time after the month of november in fact after january when joe biden steps down thank you very much asan hamid durani director policy research center to have joined us to divulge uh, more on the pak us a gamut of relations and how that can be improved upon let's go on to our second segment that concerns 349th day of uh, the Israel Palestine conflict we've been joined by uh, Dr Mali Halodi she's a former ambassador to the United Nations Dr Saiba thank you very much to have joined us Dr Saiba uh, so much to discuss you know let's begin with one thing that we have been talking about since a very very long time and that is about the peace deal now officials in the US as far as a report by the Wall Street Journal is concerned believe that a ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas in, in Gaza is unlikely quote and quote before president joe biden leaves office in january of 2025 it quotes that there are two key obstacles to this deal a the number of palestinian prisoners israel must release in exchange for each captive held by hamas b the rising tensions between israel and hezbollah will the deal uh, therefore not happen this year uh, and how has these uh, these incidents that have recently happened in lebanon affected these two stocks Well, for a start, uh, we are coming up to almost a year uh, of the war that Israel imposed on Gaza. So I think the obstacles are not the points that you cited. The two obstacles are Israel and the United States. If the United States wanted a ceasefire, we would have seen a ceasefire. I mean, having to wait for one year uh, during which thousands of Palestinians have been martyred. children and women have been killed in cold blood devastation has taken place in gaza so i haven't seen any seriousness on the part of washington for a ceasefire so to say that you know it's now looking unlikely it is always unlikely because what did the us do the us was vetoing resolutions at the un security council calling for a ceasefire the only time that there was a kind of a ceasefire all by the security council for a humanitarian cause and that was during ramadan even that israel did not comply with and the united states did nothing uh, to to urge israel to abide by that so i mean this doesn't surprise me that uh, there are reports now that a ceasefire is going to be unlikely of course it's going to be unlikely uh, if the us uh, just refuses uh, to put pressure on israel and the prime minister of israel sees his political future tied to continuing the war then how are we going to see any success in any negotiation so israel was never serious about these negotiations and the united states was never serious about putting enough pressure uh, on tel aviv uh, to agree to a peace deal and then you know the second part of your question number about how the latest developments are going to affect the chances of any peace obviously they take away any slim chance of peace because what is israel doing right now it is expanding the war it has carried out air strikes on beirut today in lebanon it has carried out a uh, pager bombing uh, in lebanon as you know the last uh, couple of days so what does this all mean it means that israel is opening another front uh, in this war so that does not bode well at all but i think uh, you know the situation is getting from bad to worse and we now see a real danger of a widening of the conflict and a spreading of the war to the middle east across the middle east all right before i come to lebanon I'd, uh, you know you mentioned the united nations the ung adopted a resolution by 124 to 14 with 43 countries abstaining uh, on of course this illegal occupation of israel on uh, palestine uh, will uh, such a resolution have any impact whatsoever 
Well, this resolution of the General Assembly is non-binding. I mean, all General Assembly resolutions are non-binding. It's only the Security Council, which has the authority of um, passing or adopting binding resolutions. But frankly, I mean, Israel hasn't even complied with Security Council resolutions which are binding. So this particular resolution, I think, reflects global opinion. And global opinion is very clear. Uh, because, you know, the General Assembly is often called the Parliament of the World. So the Parliament of the World has spoken not once, but several times on the need for Israel to end the war, the need for Israel to end the occupation of Palestine. But what has been the outcome? The outcome has been that Israel has defied global opinion. It has defied international law. It has defied any humanitarian norm and has carried on genocide and ethnic cleansing in Palestine. That is so true. Now, you know, Hezbollah firing uh, and Israel firing rockets into each other's territories. Latest is that Hezbollah has fired at least 140 rockets into Israel after southern Lebanon was targeted by uh, Israeli attacks. Then, Israeli opposition leader Yair Lapid believes that the government is dangerously hurtling towards a multi arena conflict that could mean Israeli forces are simultaneously present in Gaza, West Bank and Lebanon. Israeli warplanes have also targeted the towns of mahmoud e Kar al-Arush and Birkat Jabur. I think I'll revert this question to Dr. Malia because we were going in a certain flow. Dr. Malia, I'll ask you this very question because you were also mentioning Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, the tit for tat, I mean, it's not a tit for tat, but of course Hezbollah is reacting to what Israel is doing. Hezbollah did fire more than 150 rockets into uh, Israel. Uh, southern Lebanon before that was targeted by Israel. As I just was just mentioning, Yar Lapi, who's the Israeli opposition leader, says that the government in Israel is dangerously hurtling towards a multi-arena conflict and Israeli warplanes are targeting different towns in uh, Lebanon as well. Uh, this low-level conflict that had begun since the 7th of October when Hezbollah had said that we are going to side with Palestine and we will continue uh, our aggression towards Israel till such time that this war also comes to an end. The war isn't coming to an end but this aggression is increasing manifold. Is this conflict entering a new phase? Well, that's what the Israelis are saying, and I think there is a reason and a motive for them to say that. They want this conflict to spread further, uh, because what they have always wanted is a wider conflict in the region so that they can somehow get the United States involved and join it in an attack on Iran. That has been their agenda for years. It's nothing new, but they have an opportunity right now to do this. I don't think this will happen. I don't think the U.S., which is in the midst of an election campaign, uh, is about to join in any conflict. Um, plus, I think uh, Iran itself has shown utmost restraint. Because remember, uh, Hezbollah and um, Hamas and so on are always sort of you know, accused by both Israel and the United States of being supported by Iran. Uh, but look at what Iran has done, despite uh, the Israeli attacks on Iranian territory, they have shown utmost restraint. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think when you talked about Hezbollah's rocket attacks, well, of course, you know, what do you expect them to do when they're attacked all the time? Uh, but there's no proportionality between what is happening in mm -hmm. terms of what Israel is doing mm -hmm. and what uh, Hezbollah may be doing. In fact, Hezbollah uh, has shown a lot of restraint because when this war on Gaza began by Israel, remember, uh, there was a lot of speculation about Hezbollah entering this war. But it never did. Uh, all we saw were these border tensions and, of course, the uh, rocket fire, cross-border rocket fire. But now uh, Israel is escalating the tensions with Hezbollah uh, to a completely new level. Uh, and that is very dangerous. So from that point of view, yes, one could say this may mark a new phase. But it's clearly a phase that Israel wants to see uh, much to the destabilization uh, and, um, you know, uh, and bloodshed, more bloodshed in the region. All right. Dr. Malia, let me revert to uh, the televised address of Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah and some of the key points that he highlighted. I'd like your point of view on them. Uh, 
he of course uh, called these attacks, these pager attack, laptop attacks uh, in, uh, in Lebanon as a big blow in terms of security and humanity, but said they have failed to bring the group to its knees. He has uh, conceded that the attacks was un were unprecedented in the history of resistance as well as the history of country and our enemy. But he said that Hezbollah will continue to support Palestine in Gaza no matter what the consequences are, what the sacrifices are, what scenarios will unfold. Uh, from, he said from October 8 till now the Israeli forces have not pulled out of their military personnel uh, in the north. And he has also warned that Israelis who have evacuated from the area will not be allowed to return. He also said that the devices that exploded inside hospitals, inside markets, inside homes, several areas where civilians were present and Israel had willfully targeted 4,000 pages and 1,000 walkie-talkies with the aim to kill as many people as possible. He said some of the attacks that did take place in hospitals, pharmacies, marketplaces, commercial centers, private vehicles, uh, in, uh, where, where you know women and children were also present. And he also did say that the, uh, most of these assaults were uh, foiled by as many devices were out of service, turned off or kept away. But he also said what happened is not going to impact the group's command, control or infrastructure. Kindly give your comments on what uh, Mr. Nasrullah had to say. Well, Umar, you've already described what he said. You've left me very little to say. Uh, no, you said like exactly you what, what, what he said. How you, uh, how you see? How, how, how you see? How you see this? And how do you feel the West and Israel is going to take whatever uh, Hezbollah said? Because the determination of Hezbollah, as per Nasrullah, uh, remains uh, intact. And nothing will change that, no matter how many sacrifices are made. Uh, is this also a dent on the Israeli initiative to, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of pressurize Hezbollah so that they back out from this conflict? Well, Israel has been trying that for decades and they haven't succeeded. Uh, plus, I think uh, uh, Hezbollah's infrastructure, its organization remains intact. And as its leader said, of course, it was a huge setback for them, the way these uh, pager uh, bombings were carried out. And then the next day, another round of bombings uh, took place. So, I mean, this has been serious stuff. The walkie-talkies blowing up, the pagers blowing up. Uh, and it has obviously affected Hezbollah's communication uh, structure. But, you know, Hezbollah has been under assault and attack for decades. Uh, it learned. It has learned how to adapt, uh, and I think uh, you know it's resolved to carry on uh, supporting the people of Palestine. I don't think it's going to be deterred by the latest uh, round of fighting. But as I said before, I think the danger now is really uh, what kind of uh, wider conflict can break out in the Middle East, uh, because as I said before, also. America is in the midst of an election campaign, if, and if such a uh, larger conflict breaks out, I don't know what Washington's capacity is going to be in this period. It has a lame duck administration. So what can they actually do uh, if such a conflict was to break out? Uh, Dr. Malia, also the reaction from uh, the official reaction from the Lebanese government has also been quite steadfast and in support of the Palestinians. Lebanese health minister says the morale remains high. Lebanon, Lebanon's director general of civil aviation, civil aviation issues a new directive as far as the use of pages in all public places is concerned. The head of Hezbollah's executive council said the Lebanese group was in a new confrontation with Israel and it will uh, react with special punishment. Lebanon's foreign minister wants the blatant assault on Lebanon's sovereignty and security was a dangerous development that could signal a wider war. Uh, well, you know, when uh, you hear such comments and uh, it seems as if there is going to be a very strong reaction from Hezbollah, do you fear that uh, this reaction could be strong enough for this war to escalate even further? Or do you feel it will be measured uh, like many other reactions that we've seen in the past? I don't know whether I fear it. But I certainly think one should take seriously what the Hezbollah leader has said. Uh, he talked about retribution. Uh, and I was mentioning Iran earlier. Uh, the Iranian leaders also talked about retribution uh, and a reaction at a time and place of their choosing uh, to the kind of attacks that Israel carried out and assassinations that it carried out 
on Iranian soil. Uh, so it's hard to uh, you know, speculate on when that reaction will come and in what form or what shape. But I have no doubt uh, that there will be a blowback uh, to what Israel is trying to do. I don't think it will go unanswered. I agree also on that. Dr. Malia, you know, you, you mentioned Iran. I'd like to mention uh, a comment made by the new Iranian president, Masood Pazishkian, who, uh, while discussing Iran's war on Gaza in his first news conference, uh, you know, said that retaliation for the assassination of Ismail Haniya was still on the cards. And uh, he also denied claims that Iran had been providing ballistic missiles to the Houthis in Yemen. He has denied them. What my question is, can Iran restore deterrence against Israel while avoiding an all-out war? Well, I think that's exactly what they're probably thinking about right now. Uh, the fact that they did not respond immediately after the Israeli attacks shows... Uh, I mean, look, the Iranian leadership is a very wise leadership. Uh, they're sagacious. Uh, they did not get into any knee-jerk responses. So I think their aim is certainly going to be to take the kind of action that will restore a deterrence. Because what has happened is that uh, certain red lines have been crossed by Israel. Uh, they've crossed them in Iran. They've crossed them now in Lebanon. Um, and I think there, uh, the Iranian government is under pressure to come up with a response, as I said, at an appropriate time, uh, so that deterrence uh, is restored and Israel is no longer able to carry out the kind of attacks it has uh, been indulging in in the past and carrying out all these assassinations. So again, we just have to wait and see hmm. whether this can take place and when it would take place. Dr. Maliha, experts say the explosions of wireless communication devices across Lebanon widely believed to have carried out by Israel because they have yet to confirm it, but also in the past whenever these attacks have happened, they have never confirmed it. Anyways, it, all of these attacks likely constitute, quote-unquote, a breach of the laws of war. This includes possible violation of prohibitions on indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks as the blasts have killed dozens of people and injured thousands more. Will any international action be taken against this? Well, I'll say two or three things about this. First of all, it's a war crime. It's a terrorist attack. Because what they have done is they've targeted uh, anybody standing close to anybody having a pager. Uh, and two children have died. Were those children terrorists? No. The action that Israel took was a terrorist action. I have no doubt in my mind. Now, whether Israel will be held to account, well, so far it hasn't been held to account for killing more than 41,000 Palestinian, innocent Palestinians. So I don't see uh, how Israel is going to be held to account. It should be held to account, no question about it. But I'm not sure that with the United States continuing to back Israel and prevent uh, any action taken against it. I mean, look, Israel has defied the International Court of Justice. It has defied the International Criminal Court, which has called for arrest of uh, Israeli leaders. It has defied UN Security Council resolution. So, I mean, look at the record of defiance of international law. Uh, what Israel did uh, with these uh, attacks uh, on uh, through the pages and through the walkie-talkies is, is, is really uh, show the world that it has absolutely no concern for human life and that taking innocent lives, it, it has no problem doing that because it's been do doing that for decades. So it's very unfortunate uh, that, you know, I mean, I haven't seen many Western countries even condemn this. Uh, just one or two countries that I've come across in the West that have condemned this. Um, now imagine if Iran had done something like this or another country had done something like this. My God, the entire Western world would have been up in arms. They would have been condemning, censuring, sanctioning. Uh, but because Israel has done it, they don't say a word. This conspiracy of silence from the Western world, I think, is, is a disgrace. It's a disgrace uh, to humanity. Dr. Saiba, uh, you know, we all remember these pager attacks and of course, I mean, this is very recent. But uh, the Taiwan-based firm Gold Apollo, or that uh, was said to be behind these pagers because it was their models that were used. Uh, they say that uh, 
they have denied that they have produced these pages. They say they were made by a Hungarian company which has a license to use its design and branding. Now the Hungarian company also denies that the pages were made in the country. Who has then manufactured these pages? I, I mean I do not understand why you are not accepting blame for pages that uh, you know have your mark and have your uh, country of manufacturing. Well, they're not accepting it because they know that there are uh, consequences if they were to accept that. Because clearly, uh, from the evidence that uh, we have come across so far, uh, it seems that these explosives were put into these pages before they were shipped to Lebanon. Yes. There's no other way that they could explode. Uh, I mean, this is a combination of a cyber attack, but predicated or depending on explosives that are already planted inside uh, these uh, pages and these walkie-talkies. So I'm not surprised that you know these companies are not uh, taking responsibility. Why would they take responsibility? Uh, tomorrow, there could be very serious legal actions against them. Uh, they could also be co uh, held complicit in war crimes because who knows uh, whether these companies did it uh, in return uh, for money uh, or they did it out of incompetence. But whatever the case, uh, clearly this is something that happened before these pages were shipped to Lebanon. Dr. Saiba, let's revert back and let's, you know, generalize this whole Israel-Palestine conflict as well. Israel captured the West Bank, Gaza and East Jerusalem in the 1967 war and subsequently annexed the whole holy city in the year 1980. International law prohibits the acquisition of land by force. Israel has also been building settlements now home to hundreds of thousands of Israelis, continues to do that in Gaza as we speak and in the West Bank also in violation of the fourth Geneva Convention that bans the occupying power from transferring parts of its own citizen population into the territory that occupies most of the international community considers this occupation illegal. Several US allies, France, Finland, Mexico have voted in favor of Wednesday's resolution. The UK, Ukraine and Canada have abstained. I mean, just to uh, highlight this for our public. Uh, will there ever be a solution to this decades old conflict? I understand that Israel is flouting all kinds of laws and does not uh, regard any human rights law, any law whatsoever is, in, is not binding by any uh, you know, ruling by the ICC or the ICJ or the United Nations, but there needs to be a solution. What and when and how will the solution come into effect? Well, to start with, we have uh, scores, uh, not one, but many UN Security Council resolutions which lay out what the solution is. And the solution is very clear. Israel has to end its occupation. There has to be a two-state solution with Palestine, uh, an independent, sovereign, and contiguous state with Al-Aqsa as its capital. I mean, all of this is there. Uh, but why aren't these resolutions implemented? They're not implemented because of one country the United States of America, because the U.S. provides Israel the protection and other, uh, of course, other, uh, you know, Western countries are also complicit in this. Israel is an outpost of Western colonialism in the heart of the Middle East. It is a dagger in the heart of the Middle East, a dagger that's been put there by certain Western countries, which continues to be a source of bloodshed, instability, and... Uh, you know, bringing so much grief to so many people uh, in in uh, in the region. So when you say, will we ever see it? Yes, we can see it. But for that, Washington has to change its stance and accept that the Palestinians are also human beings. Because what we've seen in the last several months, almost a year, is the dehumanization of Palestinians by both the American media as well as the U.S. administration. I mean, when spokesmen of the U.S. government have been asked questions about, you know, the killings of Palestinians, they've always sort of feigned surprise uh, that, oh, really, we, well, we don't exactly know the numbers, they say. Hmm. Really? You don't know the numbers? I mean, that kind of a stance, I think, again, is morally repugnant. It's legally uh, dubious. And it only shows that for its own strategic interest, the United States can cast aside any consideration for human life and for international law. 
All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Maliha Lodi, former ambassador to the United Nations, to have joined us and to have talked extensively about the different uh, details that have emerged of late, whether it be the pager and laptop bombing in uh, uh, Lebanon, whether it be the repercussions of that, the attacks, the brutality that are going on in Lebanon and in Paris. And thank you very much to have joined us. It's extremely pertinent that uh, people like you, uh, you know, um, uh, join hands and, of course, contribute to this, uh, to discussions on this very important topic. Let's end with these two uh, stories. The first of Pakistan being elected as member of the IAEA's Board of Governors uh, for a two-year term between 2024 and 2026. Uh, this was uh, done by consensus at the 68th session of the IAEA's General Conference in Vienna from the Middle East and South Asia region for the term that begins this month as well. Uh, this is also to remind this is Pakistan's 21st term on the IAEA's Board of Governors. Finally, Turkish doctors, ladies and gentlemen, have successfully separated 11th month old Pakistani conjoined twins in a marathon 14 month 14-hour, no, not 14-month, 14 14-hour 14 surgery. Now, this was a team of 60 medical professionals in the Turkish capital of Ankara who have separated these twins uh, uh, after a two-stage operation that lasted around 15 hours, 14 hours plus. These twin girls, Mirha and Minal, were born in Pakistan with their heads fused, unable to find suitable treatment. The family's plea uh, for help caught the attention of Turkish President Rajab Tayyab Erdogan. And of course, after having been contacted by a London-based pediatric neurosurgeon, uh, the uh, needed was done. And after this 14-hour marathon operation, of course, these twins were separated. And now, slowly and steadily, they are gaining back, uh, you know, their movements in the limbs and, of course, elsewhere as well. We wish both the twins uh, healthy and a speedy recovery. And of course, it's a hallmark uh, for uh, uh, all such operations and for the parents of uh, these two children as well who are extremely worried about them. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to an end to, of today's news. We'll see you, inshallah, on Monday with new stories and segments that pertain to us, you and Pakistan. Stay safe. Have a great week and Allah Hafiz.